271.2 million PCs were sold in 2007. But out of all those computers, how many of them are still usable in 2025? Well, this right here is one of them. A $500 PC from 18 years ago that was probably fine for checking emails and browsing Internet Explorer back in the day but now it's painfully slow. Booting up takes forever and it even struggles to run games older than itself. So in this video, I'm gonna show you how I not only brought this 18 year old PC back to life, but made it capable of running modern games for just $28. This was not an easy challenge, so let's dive right in. The PC we're reviving today is my uncle's ancient HP Pavilion desktop. And just like me, it spent about 18 years in the basement. But let's take a look at what's inside to find out what actually needs to be revived. Starting with the CPU, we've got an AMD Athlon 4200+. Plus. Released on December 1st, 2006, this was once a solid 2-core processor that could handle most games of its time. It originally retailed for $537, which adjusted for inflation makes it an $800 CPU today more expensive than the current fastest gaming processor. So while it wasn't the best of its time, it was still respectable for a PC from 2007, but the GPU on the other hand is about as bad as it gets. It's the Nvidia GeForce 6150 LE. Wait, you don't see it? Let me zoom in. Move a bit to the right, and there it is, integrated into the motherboard. Yeah, it's about 1100 times worse than the 4090, so it's pretty bad. And if you thought that was the worst part of this computer, boy do I have something to tell you, because we've got 1024 megabytes of RAM. These days, we're used to seeing memory in gigabytes, not megabytes. As for the speed, a painfully slow 533 megahertz. And finally, for the storage, we've got a 320 gigabyte hard drive. Sure, it might get pretty loud at 7200 RPM, but I'm definitely not gonna hear it through this thick ass metal case. Knowing all this, you can see why this PC is barely holding on, but with just $30 and a little bit of luck, we're about to bring it back to life and make it run better than it ever did. But before installing any upgrades, we need to make sure the PC actually boots up. If I do end up spending days on this challenge, the least I can ask for is that the desktop is alive in the first place. And when I turned it on, something completely unexpected happened. It booted straight into Windows 10. That means it was still being used after 2015. So this HP lasted my uncle over eight years. Considering how fast computer innovation was moving in the late 2000s and early 2010s, it's pretty crazy that this thing kept going. But running Windows 10 could be an issue. It eats up a ton of resources, so we might even need to downgrade to Windows 7 or even XP. Just as I was about to test if it could handle basic tasks like playing a browser game or watching YouTube, I realized I couldn't log in because I had no clue what the password was. The hint is my girlfriend, but apparently my uncle had so many so he has no idea which one it could be. So we're just gonna reset the PC, and then I realize it's gonna take at least 30 minutes just to reset when I'm not even gonna end up running Windows 10 anyways. Now you might be asking, why do you not just stick with Windows 10 or install Linux if Windows 7 was going to be such a pain? And that is a very valid question. Well, it turns out I didn't choose to install Windows 7 just because I felt like it. It's the newest version of Windows that's officially supported by my old Athlon processor, and it still has DX11 support, which a lot of the newest games use. As for Linux, I have zero experience installing it on hardware this old, so I didn't want to do that either. But after everything that's gone wrong in my past challenge videos, I thought there was no way that simply downloading Windows 7 would cause any problems. I couldn't have been more wrong. Every website I visited to try and find a working Windows 7 file was either taken down for copyright infringement or straight up didn't work. But after finally finding an unofficial copy, the frustration didn't stop there. I struggled for hours trying to get it running. During the first three of many hours trying to get Windows 7 running on this PC, I kept running into unexpected issues. By 8.16pm, I was considering deleting all partitions as a last resort. And even then, I couldn't get this metal box to function properly. So I did what any reasonable person would do. I gave up. Kind of. This was when I decided to install Windows 10 instead thinking I could always switch back to Windows 7 or Linux later if I ran into issues. But after reinstalling Windows 10, I realize I've just thrown away hours of my life only to end up exactly where I started. I tested it out with Bonk.io, a simple 2D browser game, and the FPS was so low it was almost unplayable. Sure, I expected it to be slow, but this was somehow worse than I anticipated. I tried updating my OS to see if that was the problem, but despite my gigabit ethernet connection, it still took another 2.5 hours to install the updates. 
It wasn't until I saw it was going to take another four hours just to apply those updates that I realized there was no point in waiting around. Four hours to update my PC. Holy sh**. The hard drive was just too slow to do anything. So I made the decision to skip all that testing and jump straight into the upgrades. Surprisingly, this turned out to be the only part of the challenge that went without any complications. As I just said, I knew the hard drive was the biggest issue, so I replaced it with a 256GB WD SATA SSD. It's not the fastest drive out there, but it's a big improvement over the old HDD. After reinstalling Windows, I immediately noticed the difference. Boot times were much quicker, and even browsing felt faster. Now I should mention that I got the SSD for free from my dad's workplace. While the revival would still be very cheap if I did buy every single part, to keep it under $30, I unfortunately had to rely on some free stuff. But on the bright side, I'm going to be able to max out the specs, starting with connecting the fastest possible GPU. According to ChatGPT, the fastest GPU I could pair with the CPU would be the GTX 750 Ti. Low power, doesn't need external power connectors, and is cheap enough to make sense in this build. But I thought we could go even cheaper. And faster too. That's when I decided to pair the AMD Athlon 4200 Plus with the NVIDIA Quadro K4200. I sniped this thing for just under $21 about a month ago, and it performs better than the 750Ti, so it was a pretty obvious choice. The only issue is this GPU needs a 6-pin power connector, and the power supply simply doesn't have one. So that means we can't use this GPU, right? Nope, that just means I need an adapter, and there are two ways to do this, Molex to 6-pin or SATA to 6-pin. Since SATA adapters are way more common, I went looking for one, not knowing that this would potentially damage my hardware. Definitely not foreshadowing anything, I promise. eBay and AliExpress had decent prices, but shipping was way too long, so I took the hit and grabbed two dual SATA to 6-pin adapters on Amazon for $7.62. But while we wait for the adapter to arrive, we still have another issue to deal with the RAM. With only one gigabyte in this thing, we might not even be able to open one Google tab. What I didn't mention earlier is that my uncle had already upgraded the RAM to 3 gigabytes, which makes sense because there's no way he was running Windows 10 on just one gigabyte. However, the motherboard caps out at 4, so I figured I might as well add one gigabyte more. I conveniently found a 2 gig stick of DDR2 RAM at my grandma's house, and this adds about $6 to our total cost if I wasn't lucky enough to get one for free. Time to pop that in. It is now Sunday, March 16th, and I've finally received the Molex to 6-pin adapters I ordered. You might be thinking, these aren't the SATA adapters you said you were gonna buy, and you'd be right. I refunded the SATA adapters not just to save an extra dollar to say I did the challenge with only $28 instead of $29, but because Molex is generally safer. Unfortunately for me, I went for the cheapest, lowest quality adapters, so there is a genuine fire hazard. So I'll be operating the PC with the case open, just in case. Now all that's left is installing the drivers, and we can finally see how this PC performs after everything we've done. We're gonna put this PC to the test by running it through games from a few years before and after its release, and even try some modern gaming to see how well it holds up. But before we get to the benchmarks, a quick word from today's sponsor, me. I've launched $1 channel memberships, and it's the best way to support the channel while unlocking some exclusive content. For just a dollar, you'll get access to members-only live streams, custom emojis, and an upgradable badge next to your name to stand out in the comments. And if you want even more, higher tiers unlock exclusive videos, behind-the-scenes photos, early access to new uploads, and even member shoutouts at the end of my videos. So if that sounds interesting to you, or you just want to support my hobbies, be sure to press that join button down below or click the link in the description. Anyways, let's see what this revived PC can can really do. Let's start with the oldest game first, Tomb Raider Anniversary. At 1080p high, this game consistently runs above 100 FPS with every visual setting enabled. And it can go as high as 150 when you're doing the climbing sections or in any small area. Nonetheless, an extremely smooth experience. Tomb Raider Legend, though not nearly as smooth, can still get up to the 100s in confined spaces. Otherwise, it's usually around 60 to 70 FPS in these larger areas. However, it can get fairly demanding when you enable next generation content where the FPS dips below 60 FPS. But for a game like this, you don't really need 400 FPS to have a good time. And for the last game in the trilogy, Tomb Raider Underworld does a pretty fine job at 1080p high settings at the start, staying above 60 FPS for the most part. But once you get into these areas where there's a lot of lighting effects and just stuff going on in general, it dips as low as 20 FPS. 
FPS, which I personally will never consider to be playable. After experiencing huge performance drops as low as 20 FPS in Tomb Raider Underworld, you might expect the next games to be unplayable on this system. However, Tomb Raider 2013 strangely runs very well. Though it is one of the most graphically demanding games of its time, it's equally well optimized to the point where we're pulling over 70 FPS at 1080p high settings. Cranking up the settings to the ultra preset and we can still hold over 60 FPS pretty easily. Only at the ultimate preset do we start dipping below 60 FPS due to the TressFX hair physics. Very impressive stuff from both the computer and the game optimization. But once we get to Rise of the Tomb Raider, everything just falls apart because the CPU and RAM are both below the minimum requirements and there's nothing we can do about that. But the fact that one of the most demanding AAA games of 2015 can even open on this PC is kinda crazy, so I'm not too sad. Anyway, if you want to see me optimize a 24-year-old PC until it plays anything, watch this video next.